is. And most of us don't live in a brand new home that was built after 2008 that meets the new construction standards. Most of us live in older construction. So what do we do for our existing homes? What can we do to, to retrofit those existing homes? So today's presentation is really th about thinking about what kind of exposure your home is likely to experience. And what are the small details that on many cases are not very costly that you can uh, adjust to really substantially improve the, out the likely outcome of your house when it experiences wildfire. So today, um, I'm going to talk about this concept of fire resiliency, uh, but it's in context with lots and lots of pieces uh, of, of, of action, right? You know, so we've got weather forecasting and alerts, like are you aware, are you prepared? How do you evacuate? What does that evacuation look like? Are you prepared for both lanes evacuating out? Um, you know, having communities ready to be able to really uh, think about rapid evacuation is a huge and significant challenge. Uh, you know, what's the role of wildland management, fuels reduction? Uh, you know, and this is where most of our discussion has been about, about how do we reduce the fuels in the community? Um, but there's so much more in fire resiliency than just this component. There's also roles that you know, open space and agriculture provides, both as uh, safe zones for retreat if you need to, and, and providing buffers for, for uh, urban communities. But then we have to think about infrastructure production, like our utilities, our, uh, our water resources, our hospitals, you know, all these critical pieces that need to function in the middle of a, of a, you know, a significant fire event. So what do we do? to try and address these issues. And so there's a combination of kind of land use planning, which deals with zoning and building codes, uh, but there's a whole element about fire resilient homes. And you'll hear the term fire hardening. Um, I don't know what the right language is to grab people's attention, but this has sort of been the um, untapped component in this conversation. Most of the focus has been on wildland management and on alerts and forecasting, but not sort of connecting all these dots. And so it's exciting, I think, uh, where the time and place we are, because we're having a much more enhanced conversation about the, the interactions and the intricacies between all these components. So today's presentation is going to be broken into four parts uh, about you know, how homes burn from wildfire, what can you do about the vegetation and landscaping near your home, uh, where the vulnerabilities are in your home, and then uh, an analysis of the resources that are available. Um, my information uh, is largely from a colleague, Dr. Steve Quarles, uh, who was a, a durability expert, someone focused on wood products and how, how they performed through time. Uh, he retired from the University of California, and I worked with him 10, 15 years ago on a number of, of important educational comp components. And then he went on to the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. And part of that um, interest was because he got a lab much bigger than this building a lab big enough that he could build homes and then expose them to wildfire and then look at them in a very uh, empirical way to figure out what exactly the failure point was and be able to compare one product to the other and provide independent testing. Because you know every supplier of a product always says they have the best product, but really is there that third party verification behind it? And so Steve would, would do that analysis as well as really show the pathway of entry into homes. And then um, he's recently retired from that organization and come back as an emeritus within the University of California. And so together we've been really trying to amplify these issues because there's not very many experts in the, in the United States or in California that understand these relationships and are backed by data to be able to, to help people make wise decisions. So this would be an example of, of that laboratory he has available. Um, and so how do homes burn from fire? Most people think it's about direct flames, a flaming front that's going to come to your house, right? You know, there's going to be a wall of flames, and then your house is going to just rapidly combust. Um, that's one type of, of fire exposure. There are two others that are really important to understand. Um, the most important being embers, so that is burning bits of vegetation that get picked up in the air currents and moved long distances, maybe as much as a mile away. And those burning bits of vegetation find some weak point in your home or find something uh, that's ignitable to, to, to land upon. Um, there's also another important part and that is radiant heat. So when your neighbor's house catches on fire, depending how close your neighbor's house is to yours, your house may be overwhelmed by that radiant heat. So if you ever had a wood stove and you put something too close to that wood stove and it starts to smoke, 
that's a great example of radiant heat. You didn't have direct flame contact, but you had enough heat to, to create that. So I'm going to explain all three of these and sort of show where the vulnerabilities are in the house. What most people don't understand is that windblown embers are responsible for the majority of ignitions. And you can see this time and time again where you have a home that's gone and the, and the surrounding trees, the surrounding vegetation wasn't touched. So what happened here? How did that home catch on fire? It's almost like it seems like it's the impossible odds. And yet they seem to burn from the inside out. And that's because of embers. And so I'll show you a couple of examples of it. This comes from South Lake Tahoe and the Angora fire, uh, which was a game changer as well. Here's another example. You look at that house or, or the footprint of where that house was, and look at all that green, and you think, of course it had amazing defensible space. But defensible space, in terms of what is around your home, is part of it, but also how your home is designed, how you maintain it, and all the you know, attention to all the small little details. So let's try and figure out what we can do with that. So the basics of fire really is about understanding that you need fuel, you need something to burn, you need oxygen so that combustion can happen, and you need enough heat to be able to maintain that, right? Now, fire behavior is affected by, again, fuel, the weather you have, whether you, you know it's dry, whether it's windy, whether it's wet, and the topography. So slopes always increase fire behavior. We can't really control these elements, but what we can control is the fuel. And so I want to help think through what is fuel. You know, typically, fuel is chaparral, it's, it's trees, it's uh, you know the things that we think of as natural vegetation. But it also can be fencing, it could be a broom, it could be your landscape um, furniture, you know, your outdoor furniture. It could be your cushions. It could be the pile of newspapers you have outside. It could be anything, uh, really, when you, when you take a moment and step back. So let's try and think about what we can do to manage this fuel issue. All right. So as we move into uh, coming into the home, we'll first talk about the near-home vegetation and the landscaping. So there's a fundamental uh, paradigm shift that's happening in thinking about defensible space. And uh, until really a few years ago, most of the focus of defensible space was on two zones. And the 30 to 100 foot zone, so this component here, um, and I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. And then a, a larger zone about 30 feet outside and around the house. Um, but but when you look at all the graphics, the infographics and the guidance, it was pretty silent about what's right next to the house. And we've developed an aesthetic in California. Um, it, I think partly it's thankful to Sunset Magazine and Frank Lloyd Wright and this idea that our home is not beautiful unless it's anchored by vegetation. No, none of us want to see our foundations. We, <coughs> we want to have this little curlage zone where we put our flowers and we put our shrubbery and you know we, we, we attach the home to the ground by this uh, vegetation. Well that vegetation is creating significant vulnerabilities in, in, our, in our ability to, to resist fire. So we've now expanded our educational materials to talk about uh, a five foot zone around the house and any attached deck. Under and around any attached deck. And so. Uh, I'm working on some um, policy work right now that really codify the importance of this, this zone. Um, and so, you know, I believe that we can get to that aesthetic appeal that we've had, uh, but we just need to think about it in a little bit different place. We tend to have the house, the garden beds, and the walkway. What if we have the house, the walkway, and the garden beds, right? You still have that visual anchoring. You still can drive up and see the garden beds. Uh, but it would be much better for our house if we had the walkway on the other side and closer to the house. Okay, so here's an example. This is what the standard has been out there. You can see the visual, this idea that, you know, if you live in a forest environment, uh, that you've got a reduced fuel zone, you've got trees that are separated from each other, and you've got uh, vegetation more in islands. And the reason you want to have this is if you do have a wildfire approaching. You could have a fire that's in the, the green part of the crowns of the trees, and when it encounters this reduced fuel zone, the fire will come out of the crowns and lay back down and be on the ground, which is great. I mean, that's, that's what you want if you have a fire that actually has a flaming front that comes to your house. 
But as you can see in the, in the visuals that have been standardly available, there's this idea that you know, we can have all this vegetation right next to our house. So if you have an amber-driven fire, you can see how this material can just come right over that, that, um, that defensible space in the kind of classic way we thought about it up until now. So here's some points of illustration. This is from Reading. This is uh, relatively close to where the fire tornado came through. This is a surviving house. I don't know um, whether there was firefighter response on this house, um, but Reading was pretty overwhelmed when the fire tornado came through, which came through kind of right over in this zone. You can see this nice green lawn, and so in most of you know my time before, I would look at that and go, hey, it's great. Well, what was here, as you can see, was probably some boxwood, um, and so you can, and there was some combustible mulch that was surrounding this house, and you know the house survived, right? But what you can't see is that each one of those windows is cracked, and so there was a lot of heat that was generated from from this uh, material catching on fire. What I don't know, as I said, is whether then there was a firefighter who came in and put water on it and, and put that out. I suspect there was. Um, otherwise, I think you would have had the second pane of the windows break and then fire enter through those windows. The other point is that under this, this um, if you imagine this five foot zone, is you encounter the eaves. So think about how those air currents begin to circulate once you have fire right next to your house. And what do you have underneath your eaves? Wood. Wood, but you also have other things. Vents. You have vents underneath your house, right? So this becomes a very um, important component in, in your defense, is trying to make sure that those vents don't get penetrated. So the five feet is really about trying to understand how far out your overhang is on your house. If you have a greater overhang, then I would say you would want something greater than five feet. Everyone always asks us about fire-resistant plants, and we've concluded that there is no fire-resistant plant. Uh, here's, here's some cactus, for example, from the Tubbs fire. You know, all plants will burn regardless of how they're marketed. I can't tell you whether you're going to, you know, have the right cultural care and water that plant appropriately and prune that plant appropriately. You know, there might be some a plant that looks on the outside to be good, but if, if the person who who purchases that plant doesn't maintain it appropriately, then it becomes a non-fire resistant plant. So, you know, really it's about uh, maintenance and it's about understanding when you need to prune, how you need to irrigate, how you need to remove the dead material, all those pieces. In general, when you're closer to the home, we really recommend that you select low growing, open structured, you know, less resinous, so less, you know, less conifer type, high moisture uh, plants. <coughs> Certainly natives uh, can, be, can be good in this example, but they have to be maintained. So, you know, just because it's marketed as a fire-resistant plant, you know, don't, don't just buy that type. Really, you have to pay attention to where you place it, right plant, right place, and how you maintain it. All right, so this is the quick talk. So we could go into more detail on these in a lot of ways, but I'm just trying to touch on some of the high points. So what are the vulnerabilities in the home itself? So there's lots of points of entry, and I, I talked about one for a minute. Um, so I don't know if any of you have a house that has a dormer, so it's like a little mini roof that, that sticks out on the roof plane, or you maybe have a complex roof where you have two roofs that intersect. The vulnerable point in this element is when you have roof to wall. Yeah. So you've got your class A rated roof here that's designed to resist fire, has a certain fire rating, but this wall does not. Right? And so it's a great place for leaf material to accumulate, uh, all kinds of stuff catches there. And you know, even if you do a really good job of trying to maintain that, but what I've seen in most of these recent fires is they tend to have big wind events with them and all kinds of material comes down the moment that the fire is really starting to get going. So if you have a more complex roof design here, there are things you can do to this siding to actually make a difference. There's also the rain gutter to roof edge. So rain gutters are really important when we live in a, in a Mediterranean climate that experiences a lot of rain because the rain gutters keep the water from, from um, landing on the side of the, of the house on the siding and creating rot issues on the siding. So we need rain gutters, but they also are great reservoirs to collect material. And it's fairly easy to envision that you've got a fire in the rain gutter and then the fire gets underneath the roof because you've got the, gut, you've got the roof and then you have the gutter, 
and they're sitting like this, and you get the fire, and it just comes right underneath. Uh, the fence, the house uh, concept is pretty easy to imagine. You've got, you know, often a wood, wood fence. You can often have a plastic fence. Uh, that is a, a fine, small material, easy to ignite that material, and then the fire is just whipped right to the house. And then these are examples of, again, coming back from that lab, where you can instrument the inside of an attic and look at the points of entry. So embers are being blasted at a house, blasted like hail, you know, hitting at high intensity, and they find their way into these vents, the gable and vents, the underneath vents, and these are the sparks of those embers coming into the attic. Do any of you store anything in your attic? I do, right? Uh, so what if it lands on my kid's schoolwork, like I store in my attic, because I can't figure out where else to put it? Boom, instantly I have a fire inside my house, and the house is burning from the inside. All right. These are all things that we can do something about. So structural survival has lots of priorities. The most common one that people want to ask me about is, oh, I should replace my siding. I want you to look at where this sits in the priority. The siding is down here in number six spot. So the most important parts are the roof edge and the vents. And that's because of embers and the type of exposure that, that those, uh, those components may, uh, may experience. Kind of coupled with all of this is really that vegetation and that defensible space and that zero to five foot zone. It's not to say that that out to 100 is important. I just want you to work from the house outward. What I see most people have done have worked from the 100 foot inward because it's their curtilage zone. It's their special place. But if you reorient and start thinking about what could ignite right next to my house and then work your way out, you'll, you'll do a lot to protect yourself. And then from, from there, then we're going to talk about windows, decks, and siding. So uh, these are all exposed to both embers as well as radiant heat, as well as direct flame contact. All right. So roof is the number one priority. Uh, look at the roof and look at the roof vulnerability points. There's, uh, you can often have a vent along the top of the, of the roof cap here, uh, a through roof vent, which is great. You can have roof to wall, you have skylights, you have roof edges. Each of these places make a difference. So if you have a roof that's getting old, that is in need of repair, and you feel like you're in a fire prone area, here's another reason to replace that roof. When you replace that roof, you need to understand that there are, there are places where there are nooks and crannies where embers can get in, especially if you have some type of tile roof. So this is a terracotta uh, tile roof example, and this roof is designed to have what's called bird stopping. Um, so it's a, it's a clay that uh, seals up the edge of that roof, and you can imagine that a bird would find a nice little home in there. Well, an ember could also find a nice little home in there. If you have a terracotta roof, please inspect your edge and understand that that edge is really important uh, and really critical. If you have you know, other types of tile roofs, you can see these kind of gaps that are easily penetratable by uh, an ember or, or some other critter, too. Um, the other piece is that you need to have a piece of metal flashing at the edge of the roof. Mm -hmm. So you have your roof, so you have your roof decking, you put a piece of flashing like this, it's a really cheap piece of flashing, um, and then the roofing goes on top of that, and then the gutter sits up next to it. It provides a metal continuous edge there. It's code, it's standard, but you know, if someone's on the cheap, that little detail could be missed. And that's important. Or if you're doing it yourself, you've got to understand that that little piece of flashing makes a bigger difference than you, than you might realize. We talked briefly about this, about how litter accumulation, um, and I'm sure if you go back and look at your own homes, um, you'll see these places of, of connection, and you'll see that they become a great location for material to accumulate. So you know, make that a pattern and a process to regularly try and, try and move that material as best as possible. The longer it sits there, the more it anchors in, and the harder it is to remove. And, you know, again, we were talking about what can you do on this, in this situation. So you can actually put a fiery retardant um, gypsum board that has uh, a little more resistance, a little longer time that can increase the durability of that um, wall for exposure to fire. So there's some modifications you could do that would be relatively inexpensive. Uh, again, if you have wood siding here, I might replace it with some fiber cement siding, um, knowing that this is a, a place that you would have a lot of potential for exposure. So, again, just re-hitting this idea of gutters and the importance of gutters and how to clean, 
clean gutters. There are some gutter guards out there that are designed to keep the material out. Um, none of them have been tested for how they perform in fire. Um, we're interested in trying to take that task on. If you do have gutter guards, I think they make sense just uh, thinking about them, but you're going to want metal gutter guards, something that's not combustible, because if you have a plastic gutter guard, then you certainly have something that can catch on fire. There's a difference between, here's a plastic gutter versus a metal gutter. The metal gutter is going to stay anchored, it's going to, it's going to burn until that, you know, the material is exhausted. The plastic gutter will actually melt and fall away and then create an exposure on the side of your house. So, depending on what, what it lands on, there may be another issue there. Here's an example of the car fire. This is a survivor home. Um, this fire started with the, the gutters themselves, and there was a bunch of maple leaves that were stuck in these gutters. And I happened to meet the firefighter who responded to this, to this actual house. It was really interesting. Randomly, we connected. He was from Mendocino County, and I said, oh, yeah, I've got this great picture of, of this example here. So the gutter caught on fire, and then it moved into the attic as, as I expected, and then they had to cut some of the, um, the roofing panels out to be able to respond to it. And they were able to extinguish the fire, though this house is probably damaged beyond what most people's interest in repair is. So, again, I'm really surprised that this vegetation didn't catch on fire, but uh, it was driven really by, by the gutters in this situation. Skylights. Everybody loves skylights, but you need to be able to maintain them. Um, and there's an example. Here's this is a glass skylight. These are plexiglass skylights. Um, you know, the plexiglass ones are, you know, have some some performance, you know, improvements in that they, uh, you know, keep the vegetation away. Uh, they're not rated as well as the glass one is. The whole point is that you want to keep the material off your house, and if you can, you know, you may just need to really step it up significantly if you have this kind of situation. Okay, priority number two, the vents. So there's through roof vents, there's gable end vents, there's foundation vents, there's underneath vents. So let me explain what vents do. Vents are like Gore-Tex. Vents let the hot air out, the hot moist air out often, but they let cool air in and they create circulation. So these vents underneath let air in and that allows the house to exhale out these uh, through roof vents on the top. The gable end vents also cause uh, an opportunity for air exchange across a very simple roof like this. So you need vents. Absolutely need vents. Otherwise your house is you know, going to rot on the inside. And then you also need these foundation vents so that you can let the earth pass out that moisture from underneath the house. All of those are super important. But vents, as we showed, really can be two-way exchange for um, material coming in as well as uh, letting that moisture out. So what can we do about that? Well, uh, until recently, the existing code for vents was quarter inch. And that quarter inch is too big. Uh, it allows those inverts to enter. So we're recommending that you move to eighth inch vent screens. This is something that you can tack on on top of your existing vents now. This can be a, a, a low cost modification. Um, but there are a few other options that are now available. One thing to be careful with is, as you go to the smaller mesh screen, if you're painting, you can easily fill the smaller mesh with paint if you're, if you're spraying, and so you can clog up all that mesh. So you, they need to function, right? So protect your vents. Be careful about them. If you have um, a home, if you have other outbuildings or your neighbor's home or something that could create direct flame contact on these, on these vents, then I'd recommend that you move to some new vents that are available, and they're easy to retrofit in. So one of the neat things that's happened in the last 10 years is there's been a whole change in vent technology, and these are now third-party test tested and verified and really functional. Um, this vent, for example, has what's called an intumescent honeycomb mesh in it. And what happens is when you've got heat come up against it, that mesh, which is made of aluminum, melts, and it seals up the vent. So. Uh, it, it will basically, it only perform for that one type of exposure, but it should, it should make a significant difference in your home survival. So you'd have to replace that vent, you know, but that would be much cheaper than the kind of uh, repair you might be experiencing otherwise. So there's different technologies. So this is a foundation vent. This is about $25 to $35. Uh, this is a gable end vent, so at the peak of the roof, one of those attic uh, venting uh, vents, and this is about $125. Just just for price numbers. 
Um, so this is another example of a gable invent. It's a baffle design, um, so it works in a, in a different way. It's just harder to get those embers through them. But air exchange happens. Uh, my under, my over, the vent over my scope has a baffle design. Works really well. And then these are through roof vents, and they've got a uh, steel wool mesh that are that is incorporated into them. So pretty cool stuff. So how many people want to take the vent challenge? It's, this is a great year to update your vents, and this would be a low-cost way to, to address fire safety in a, in a significant and short. Uh, keeps rodents out too. Keeps rodents out. Yep. Yeah. All kinds. Of, yes. Okay. Priority number four: windows. So most most people have dual pane windows. If you have single pane windows, let me tell you, this is a really good reason to replace those single pane windows. I love old windows, uh, but old windows really don't have. Um, any heat resistance to them whatsoever. So the idea with the dual pane is that you can have radiant heat at that first pane, uh, and then you still have a second pane behind it that, that can protect you. And so we're basically recommending that you have annealed glass over tempered glass, um, and this just gives you a, a sense of kind of the physics behind those behind those windows. I may not go into this in too much detail, but just to know that dual pane makes a significant difference. If you have um, Vinyl windows, they usually have a, a metal component on the inside of them that helps increase their, uh, their resistance to fire, but you'll see vinyl windows melt. Um, the vinyl frame itself often melts, but the metal part will stay intact. So, some examples. This, again, is the car fire, and you can see this crack in that first pane of the windows. So, you know, the house survives in this case, but you've got direct, uh, direct crack. And this was just, you know, a pot of of some kind of woody vegetation. I don't know if it was a rosemary or what it was exactly, but um, it got pretty hot there just from that one pot of flowers there. Here's another example of vegetation um, to house. You can see that there was firefighter response on this, on this house itself, and what happened is this vegetation caught on fire, and that led to exposure uh, to this uh, column into the little false attic around the, the cover there, and uh, through the through the window itself, this house was really lucky. Um, and you know, no damage over here, no damage over here. This is embers, right? Embers don't show any mercy, and you don't know what level of exposure you're going to get. Here's paradise. Uh, so paradise, we know, had you know, really intense fire exposure. There's about 120 new homes that were built after the new construction standards in 2008. This house met those new construction standards. It survived. I don't know if it had firefighter response. Most every house in this neighborhood did not um, survive. They're a little older. But you can see on this cushion that was behind this house how much ember exposure this house got. You see all these little melt points. In, in the lawn, these are the kinds of embers that the house was getting attacked with. Um, these are probably construction embers at this point, so the neighboring houses are on fire and those are embers coming from that burning house, not just from the, the wildland. And the light quality is maybe not the best, but there was combustible mulch uh, surrounding this house. Every one of the windows are broken. So a simple little change of putting the walkway a little closer to this house, pulling the vegetation back just a smidge, and I, my guess is there would have been no damage to this house at all. So uh, I've got a figure at the end that shows Paradise, because Paradise is super interesting. It's one of the only communities that we've encountered that has a whole bunch of new houses in it. 120, that's a whole bunch. But we can see how, through the decades, what home survival was like. It increases through time, and it makes a, it makes a jump in the, in the last decade. Um, but only 40% of the houses survived that were built after 2008. And I believe that it has a large part because the codes have been totally silent about what's right outside the house. And what happens with time, right? The vegetation grows, we accumulate more stuff, you know, we're pack rats by nature. And so, you know, this house wasn't that old, so there wasn't that much stuff outside. The older, the longer, the older the house is, the longer that we live there, the more the vegetation's grown, the more that there's fuel surrounding our houses. Okay, priority number five, decks and deck attachment. Um, so certainly wood is combustion. I, I, won't, I won't deny that. But do you start a fire, like a campfire, with a two by six? No. No, you're always going to start with something smaller, right? You're going to start with leaf material, little little branches or twigs or kindling. So decks by themselves don't just ignite. They have to have something that's going to ignite them. 
and met, much of the time that can be the small material that's collected in between the deck boards themselves, it can be the stuff we store underneath the deck, and it can be the stuff on top of the deck. So the deck itself isn't um, just the problem, it's all the other stuff that we tend to put on it. So there's some new um, research which Steve just conducted about how to redesign decks, and so if, you're, if you are going to design a new deck, I'm just going to say that basically on the deck joists, you can put a piece of foil tape called foil face tape on the deck joists, uh, joists and you want to increase your gap to a quarter inch between the deck boards. And what happens is by putting that piece of foil over the top, not, in the not wrapping the entire board, is that if you get a fire, it, will, it won't move from board to, board to board to board to board and wick to the house. So really low cost uh, way to um, improve deck performance. It's a little hard to retrofit this in. I have a hard time getting those deck screws out. They tend to break. Um, so, you know, if you have a deck, uh, there's some other things to, to pay attention to, and that is if, you're get, if you need to evacuate, you want to get everything off that deck. You want to clean that deck to your rustability, and you want to make sure that you're not <laughs> pack cracking and storing stuff under your deck. You're, you want to make sure you've controlled the grass that's under your deck. You want this kind of environment so that when the embers land, they're not going to be able to find a little place to, to get a fire going and then ignite the deck above it. Fencing, fairly obvious, fairly intuitive, you know, that it's fairly easy. They tend to be small boards, you know, so more like kindling to be able to, to, to ignite relatively easily. And when we have, often have grass and leaf material that's around our fences, so you can get a little fire on the ground, which then wicks to the fencing, which then wicks to the house. So what do you do? Well, we still want fences. Here's an example of um, Coffee Park. Uh, this you could just see how the fence would brought the fire to this house. So what you do is you replace the attachment point to your house with something metal. So again, you practice that zero to five non-combustible zone, so that if you do have a fire, it's not brought it's directly to your house. Okay, I'm almost done here. But the other challenge is we know that a neighbor's home can very easily be in your in your defensible space zone, it can be close to your home. Coffee Park was a great example of that. The uh, houses were 10 feet apart, wall to wall, the drip lines were five feet apart. Once you got one home going, it was very easy for the next home to be ignited. So increasing your awareness about radiant heat, about direct flame contact from your neighbor's house, if you're in a tight neighborhood like that, all these little details are gonna make a difference. So just as I you know, wrap up, you know, the roof, again, is really the, the place to focus your initial efforts on. Um, and if you're getting a new roof, you want to make sure that you've got a Class A rated roof. Roofing materials, sometimes they are um, a standalone Class A roof. Sometimes they're assembly rated. In other words, there's more to the design to make that roof meet the Class A standard. Uh, Look at your vents, think about opportunities to upgrade to both flame and ember resistant vents, or in the interim, try and add quarter inch, I mean eighth inch uh, mesh to your existing vents. And then really start to practice and explore this non-combustible zone in the first five feet around your house. All these pieces will make a difference. There is uh, a new building code for California, it's called Chapter 7A. If you are looking for products, uh, you could go to these sites and be able to find out which manufacturers meet, meet their best designs. And really, just what I want to say is, home design, maintenance, construction can be more important than any individual fire-resistant building product. Just because you have stucco siding, just because you have a metal roof, that alone is not going to get you there. It's about all the component pieces and understanding that installation and maintenance really make a difference in increasing or decreasing the vulnerability of your house, especially to embers. And, you know, I'll just end with... Um, an epiphany I had, and that is that we've gotten into this mode where we think we can fight every fire, and we have a trained professional force that's focused on firefighting, but we don't have a trained professional for fo force focused on earthquakes, on tornadoes, on floods, right? We've accepted that they are a part of our environment, and we don't fight them, right? What, we do, what do we do? We adapt. We build smarter, we build stronger, we build in better places, we avoid other places. If we can get to that place as a society, I think that's when we'll achieve true fire resilience. We understand that fire is not something that's going to be eliminated from our landscape. It's going to be very much a part of it. So how do we do the best we can? You know, we strap our, our water tanks down, you know, our water heaters down, because we know that they can experience earthquakes, right? 
Well, if we can take that same kind of thinking and apply that to fire, we can make huge advances in our own protection and our own survivability and our own resilience. So, thank you for being a patient audience. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to share this stuff. Just a couple of inspirational examples. Here's from the car fire. There are 17 homes in the subdivision. This is the only home to have survived. It was built in the 80s. The gentleman who uh, built this home was very focused in on fire, starting from the 80s, and he implemented the non-combustible zone around his house intentionally, and it made a difference. Here's an example from Paradise. This was an older home that had just gone through a remodel. They used the new vents. Um, you could see the kind of embers that were exposed you know, by the melt points on this, uh, on this rug, and um, this home survived, and there is not a home surrounding it in two miles. So I know this house got a lot of exposure. Um, lots of interesting things about this house. Uh, and then here's the first house that I've seen that really is designed specifically with incorporating both of those concepts. This comes from near Mount Shasta in the Weed area, and you can see that they've got the new construction standards, but then they're already building in this idea of a non-combustible zone. Um, and you can envision how you can add landscaping around that that will still give it that beauty, but it's got you know, the two working together side by side. So there's lots of educational materials. You all have uh, the link to, to this, uh, you, you all have the, this talk, and so each of these um, websites are linked and you can learn more about the kinds of things that I'm talking about here. And I'll just conclude by say, showing you the, the data that we have on Paradise, which I find quite interesting. So these are in 10-year bins. Uh, this is the, the running average of total survival in 10-year bins. Here's where you can see the new construction standards come in. And you know the trend line is up, which is great, but we need to do better than that. It needs to be much higher than that. So you know, if, if we can start to implement all these concepts, I think we can make a significant difference. Thank you.